Hi everybody, on 29th of August 2023, Nitin Gadkari revealed something that could bring yet another revolution in India. One day, a day in Hindustan will come to India, that petrol import will be completed, and the whole country will be prepared for the ethanol of this country. And this move could be so big, that if it is implemented successfully, it could turn our farmers into millionaires, it could reduce the cost of petrol in the country to just 15 rupees a litre, and most importantly, this move can help control inflation in India. This move is none other than the introduction of something called flex fuel vehicles in India. Flex fuel car. Flex fuel car. Aane wala kal petrol diesel ka nahi, balki flexi fuel ka hoga. And on 29th of August, this revolution took its first step. This is when the world's first prototype of Toyota electric flex fuel vehicle was introduced by Nitin Gadkari. Toyota Kirloskar dwara. Ajo prototype world ki first BS6 stage 2 electrified flex fuel Innova Gadi aaj launch ho rahi hai. And to take this initiative one step further, on 9th of September 2023, India led the formation of something called the Biofuels Alliance on the side of the G20 summit. And now, India, Brazil and the US are the founding members of this alliance. So this move isn't just important for India, but also has a geopolitical significance. So in this episode today, let's do a deep dive and try to understand what exactly is so special about this concept of flex fuel vehicles, how the hell can it reduce the cost of petrol to just 15 rupees a litre and control something as powerful as inflation in India, how will it help the farmers of India and most importantly, what is the biofuel alliance and why is it important for India? To understand the future of ethanol blending in India, we first have to study the past and understand where did this idea of ethanol blending come from. The answer to this question lies in something that happened in 1973 when the world was going through its first oil crisis. People can no longer afford to run cars that do 12 miles to the gallon. Petrol stations can no longer afford to fill up cars whose tanks take 20 gallon. This oil dealer is making his last delivery of the winter. When he returns to Bend, he will be out of oil. For those who don't know, in 1973, the Arab-Israeli war broke out and during this time, the United States supported the Israelis and gave them weapons and supplies. This made the Arabs extremely angry. So in order to teach the Americans a lesson, the Arabs decided to use their oil superpower and quadruple the price of oil from just $3 a barrel to almost $12 a barrel. 1973, when an OPEC oil embargo led to an international shortage and rocked the global economy. And when this happened, there was a devastating impact on economies all across the world. And just like the pandemic, the entire world witnessed a recession, millions of jobs were lost, inflation skyrocketed, and every single industry faced the brunt of the oil crisis. But while all this drama was happening, there was one country that found a wonderful solution to this crisis and presented the world with a revolutionary concept. This country that I'm talking about is Brazil and the solution that they came up with was something called ethanol blending. 30 years ago, as the price of gas rose, Brazil bet on a greener alternative when they began to distribute ethanol. Motorists in Brazil fill up their tanks with ethanol. It is available at nearly every fueling station in Brazil and is roughly half the price of gasoline. A certain amount of ethanol is mixed with petrol, which decreases both emissions and the consumption of petrol. And the best part about ethanol is that it can be obtained from various sources like sugarcane, wheat, corn and even rotten potatoes. Therefore, at the macro level, it could significantly reduce the dependence on oil imports. Now in 1975, Brazil was facing two major problems. And listen to this very very carefully because this is literally an insight into the present scenario of India. The first problem that they were facing was the drastic effect of the oil crisis. And secondly, in 1975, the sugar prices in Brazil collapsed because they had too much sugar but no buyers. So in order to tackle both these problems together, on 15th of November 1975, Brazil launched something called the Brazilian Ethanol Program, which was dedicated exclusively to the production of sugarcane fuel ethanol. And this program was established with three very important objectives. Number one, to reduce national dependence on oil imports. Number two, to promote technological and industrial development associated with ethanol fuel production. And lastly, to strengthen the sugarcane and sugar sectors in Brazil. And guess what? 
This was such a game changer for the Brazilian economy that during this phase of the ethanol program, sugarcane production increased by 50% and ethanol production skyrocketed by 500% to 2.8 billion liters. At the same time, the Brazilian government started pushing and subsidizing the auto companies to develop engines that were capable of running on 100% ethanol. So in just 9 years, by 1985, 96% of the vehicles sold in Brazil were ethanol powered vehicles. But you know what guys, here's where Brazil made one big mistake. They implemented all these policies with one underlying assumption that the oil price will never go down. And this is where the problem began. A commodities trader in here in New York today said, put on your hard hat, the sky is falling. That comment came as oil prices tumbled toward their lowest levels. In 1986, suddenly the oil prices tumbled and within a fortnight, ethanol vehicles became uneconomical. At the same time, sugar prices recovered and resulted into ethanol shortages, which further increased the price of ethanol. And last and most importantly, it further got messed up with the military dictatorship in Brazil. But you know what guys, the fun fact is that in spite of all these ups and downs, it is estimated that Brazil still saved $50 billion in oil imports from 1975 to 2002 due to ethanol blending. Therefore, in 2003, the ethanol program was again revived, but this time with the introduction of something called flex fuel vehicles. Now pay very close attention to this. Flex fuel vehicles, as the name suggests, are those vehicles that are flexible with different fuel ratios. So they could take pure gasoline, pure ethanol or a mix of both. These vehicles have sensors that can actually determine the fuel mix and adjust the operation of the vehicle accordingly. And this concept of flex fuel vehicles has been so widely accepted in Brazil that fast forward to 2023, over 89% of the new passenger vehicle sales in Brazil were flex fuel vehicles. And these vehicles allow the consumers to decide what type of fuel they want based on price and other factors. Therefore, flex fuel vehicles resolved that issue of ethanol blending that led to a collapse in consumer confidence in the late 1980s. So this time, Brazil actually achieved some incredible milestones. Since 2003, Brazil's emissions of carbon dioxide have been reduced by more than 630 million tons, which is equivalent to taking out 137 million cars off-road or planting 4 billion trees. And most importantly, they've significantly reduced their dependence on oil imports. So what does this tell us? Ethanol is not an alternative to petrol, but a complementary product to petrol to reduce the cost and reduce carbon emissions. Number two, ethanol can reduce cost because we have a ton of sugarcane in India, which makes ethanol production economical. And lastly, ethanol cannot eliminate fuel price fluctuation, but decrease the magnitude of the fluctuation because we are not dependent on foreign countries for ethanol. If this is very, very clear to you, let's understand what all this information has got to do in the Indian context. And if you look at the scenario in India and the world, it's very, very similar. Just like Brazil in the 1970s, even India and other countries are heavily dependent on oil imports. India is currently importing more than 80% of its crude oil from the foreign markets. And if you look at what's happening lately, even after multiple requests by India and other countries, the OPEC has deliberately curtailed the oil production, which is causing inflation all across the world. Just like Brazil, as of 2023, we have a humongous infrastructure for sugar and sugarcane. In fact, for the fifth straight year, we will be producing sugar in surplus. And as of 2020 alone, we had 6 million tons of sugar in excess. Therefore, there is a dire need to utilize these resources. And just like the 1970s, due to the war, fuel prices have shaken the Indian economy with inflation. This is the reason why the Indian government is preparing to de-risk the economy with ethanol blending and flex fuel vehicles. So in simple words, we can mix ethanol with petrol, petrol prices will drop down by 10 to 20%, inflation will come under control and everything will be perfect, right? Well, if any media channel tells you this, you got to stop watching that channel because ethanol has some very important challenges that need to be tackled before it can have wide scale adoption. So the question over here is, what are these challenges? Let's start with the supply side challenges first. The first main challenge back then was the lack of feedstock. For those who don't know, feedstock is a raw material that is required to produce ethanol. So back then, the government had only allowed sea molasses to be used for ethanol production. And if you don't understand sea molasses, don't worry, it's very simple to understand. In the process of sugar production, juice is extracted from sugarcane and the remaining liquid is called as molasses. 
and as sugar crystals are removed the leftover liquid is boiled again and again to produce more sugar so every time you boil it a different grade of sugar is produced and this is where you get three grades of molasses a b and c a molasses is the highest quality lightest and sweetest grade of sugar this is the grade that is actually used in baking then we have the second boiling cycle where you get b molasses this is also the kind of sugar that is used in baking but in the third cycle you get c molasses this is the darkest and the least sweet grade of molasses this grade of sugar is usually used in industrial applications and two such applications are ethanol and rum production so until 2018 the government only allowed c molasses to be used for ethanol and not a and b molasses so by default the raw material available for ethanol blending was too less on top of that the government didn't allow surplus food grains like rice and maize to be used as feedstock and the fun fact is that as of february 2022 the ministry of consumer affairs food and public distribution has revealed that more than 25000 metric tons of food grains were wasted in the previous 5 years so in short the raw materials were available but the government did not allow the usage of these raw materials for ethanol blending the second problem is the challenge of sugarcane Sugarcane by default needs a lot of water to grow and you would be stunned to know that sugarcane and paddy combined are using 70% of India's irrigation water. 1 ton of sugarcane could soak up to 3 lakh liters of water in a growth cycle and a liter of ethanol produced from sugarcane consumes at least 2860 liters of water in the process. So when there is less rainfall, production of these crops gets impacted very heavily. And again, if crop shortage happens, cost of ethanol will shoot up. So again, the prices will be volatile. This is exactly what happened in 2004 when the policy for biofuel was introduced and then due to shortage issues, the government was forced to suspend the mandatory blending of ethanol in petrol. And this brings us to the third problem, which is the limited ethanol distillation capacity of India, which basically means that we don't have enough capacity to produce as much ethanol as needed. So these are the challenges that India is facing when it comes to ethanol production and its usage. So the obvious question over here is what the hell is the government doing to overcome these challenges? Well, to overcome the problem of lack of feedstock, in 2018 the national policy for biofuels was introduced which allowed the production of ethanol from damaged food grains like wheat and broken rice. And these were those grains that were unfit for human consumption. This policy also allowed the conversion of surplus quantities of food grains, sugarcane, corn, rice and even rotten tomatoes for ethanol production. But the catch over here is that you would require the approval from the National Biofuel Coordination Committee. And as you all know, whenever you require a permission from the government, it is either an excuse for bribe or the process itself will be delayed to such an extent that eventually that process will become meaningless. But strangely there has been a significant change because if you see this table till 2018 ethanol production in India was entirely dependent on sugarcane but after this policy India started diversifying with other raw materials secondly to increase the distillation capacity the laws prohibiting stand alone units have been removed and the government is encouraging sugar mills and distilleries to enhance their distillation capacity with loans and for these loans they can avail an interest subvention up to 6% This means if a sugar mill or distillery takes out a loan at an interest rate of 10%, they would only have to pay an interest of 4% and the rest 6% will be paid by the government for the first 5 years. So this means what? The distillation companies and the sugar company stocks will benefit because of this policy. So keep an eye on these stocks. This is how by supporting the businesses with loans, by reducing the restrictions on raw materials and by allowing a diverse range of crops to be used for ethanol blending, the government is solving the supply problem of ethanol. Now the question over here is ethanol will be produced in large quantities that is fine. But what is the government doing to get consumers like you and me to use ethanol blended fuels instead of the normal fuel? Well this is where the demand side of the value chain comes in. Here again we have three challenges. The first challenge is the challenge of market viability. You see the government has set the target of 20% blend by the end of 2025 meaning in the fuel that we buy 20% should be ethanol and the objective here is to increase this percentage which will decrease the cost of fuel because without that it's very difficult to reduce the cost of petrol and according to Nitin Gadkari himself if an average of 60% ethanol and 40% electricity is taken petrol will be available at a rate of 15 rupees per liter and people will benefit but the challenge here is that if the percentage of ethanol is increased beyond 20% the conventional ic engines cannot process this fuel 
and you need to have a dedicated fleet of flex fuel vehicles to use this fuel. So with the increase in ethanol content, the government also needs to design new policies and new subsidies to help the auto manufacturers make flex fuel engines in a viable way. And one such car that we saw is the Toyota car that Mr. Gadkari unveiled. So again, the challenge over here is that the automakers who are able to benefit from this government policies and are able to produce and sell flex fuel vehicles, they will go on to benefit and the ones who cannot will not benefit from this policy. At the same time, in spite of this government policy, after the auto manufacturers bring the flex fuel vehicles, if suddenly people switch to electric, then again, these auto manufacturers will incur losses. So do you see what's happening over here? Multiple variables have to play out right so that auto manufacturers, government and the consumers can benefit at the same time. And meanwhile, the sugar manufacturers will benefit if all these three entities benefit at the same time. The second challenge is the efficiency issue. So if we use 10% or 20% ethanol blended fuels, in regular vehicles whose engine has been tweaked, the efficiency of these vehicles will decrease. So if a normal car is tweaked to use 10% ethanol fuel and then is used for 20% ethanol, it will result in 6 to 7% loss of fuel efficiency. For two wheelers, it will reduce the efficiency by 3 to 4%. So when people sense the efficiency going down, adoption will become a very tough challenge. And this brings us to the third challenge, which is the price of the flex fuel vehicles. Turns out the cost of flex fuel four wheelers would be 17,000 to 25,000 rupees higher than normal vehicles. And two wheeled flex fuel vehicles will cost 5,000 to 12,000 rupees more as compared to normal petrol vehicles. And considering the price sensitive market of India, it's going to be very difficult for the government and the auto manufacturers to convince people to buy the flex fuel vehicle. These are the demand based challenges of the flex fuel vehicles and their adoption. And the only way to solve these problems are subsidies, subsidies and subsidies. And as you all know, when subsidies are given, what happens? The government loses thousands of crores in tax revenue. And lastly, we have the disastrous consequence of the water situation in India. Because this is what the situation of water in India looks like. The western Indian state of Maharashtra is grappling with a devastating water crisis. Indians living in remote villages in the Himalayas are facing a water crisis. Long story short, if you look at which crops are used for ethanol blending, they are primarily rice, wheat, corn and sugarcane. And all these crops, except corn, are water guzzling crops. And as you can see in this table, each one of these crops consume very high amounts of water. So ethanol production will come at the cost of very high water usage. And lastly, in spite of diversification, in order to achieve 20% blend rate, almost one tenth of the existing net zone area of India will have to be diverted for sugarcane production. Do you realize how crazy that would be? If another 10% of India's net sown area is used for sugarcane, it means a lot more water consumption and more importantly, it will also put a lot of stress on other crops because their sowing area will decrease which could then increase their prices. And this is why ladies and gentlemen, the biofuel alliance comes in. Now mind you, ethanol is only one type of biofuel and biofuel as a category also includes other types of fuels like biogas and biodiesel. But in the context of ethanol blending, this alliance aims to overcome the challenges of ethanol blending through an alliance with the US and Brazil. Why these two countries? Because three of us put together, we account for 85% of the global production and 81% of the consumption of ethanol. So with this initiative, India aims to solve the challenges like limited sowing area and the high cost of ethanol vehicles. This will be done by sharing research and technological resources with each other. Secondly, the alliance aims to strengthen the global market for biofuels so that, just like oil, even biofuels can be traded. Thirdly, this alliance will either serve as a competitor or an alternative to OPEC countries which have an absolute monopoly on oil production today. And before we say goodbye guys, I want to show you the most beautiful desk I've ever seen. This company called Charcoal sent me this wonderful desk that has boosted my productivity. This table is so smart that it can suggest breaks during your brain's restorative periods. So the desk considers factors such as your age, gender and sleep data and it will monitor your work durations with sensors. So whenever your brain needs a break, it will gently let you know with its beautiful light and haptic feedback. I initially thought it's crazy, but it has actually improved my productivity. So if you find this useful, check out this beautiful charcoal table from the link in the description. And to the team of charcoal, thank you so much for sending this table guys. 
it is literally the most beautiful table i have ever used that's all from my side for today guys i have attached all the study materials in the description please have a look at it if you learn something valuable please make sure to hit the like button in order to make youtube baba happy and for more such insightful business and political case studies please subscribe to our channel thank you so much for watching i will see you in the next one